cryptocurrency is a complex topic that takes dedication and time to understand. Terms like mining, decentralization, hash, and blockchains are frequently thrown around in the crypto world. This video aims to introduce individuals into this world. These terms and more, along with a focus on how Bitcoin, Ethereum, and tokens work will be discussed. Let's start with a gentle introduction to gain some intuition. We live in the digital age, where things like physical media have all but disappeared. Inevitably other physical things will also disappear, paper money is going down this path. Most likely you get paid via direct deposit, pay for food with a credit card, pay for your coffee with the Starbucks app, pay bills with your bank account, etc. Cash is becoming obsolete in the Western world. Now it is important to understand that even though physical things are becoming digital, centralized powers remain in place. In the past, we rented our physical media at Blockbuster, for example. Now we stream it from Netflix. Both Blockbuster and Netflix are the centralized powers. To purchase things we still use the same currency, and the same institutions are behind the transaction, but instead of exchanging physical money we just move ones and zeros around in the digital realm, but again centralized powers remain in place, namely the banks. Cryptocurrencies aim to remove this centralization in our increasing digital world. This is what is meant by decentralization. You may be asking, what does that look like? How could we possibly decentralize something like Netflix? Well this is exactly what BitTorrent does. When you stream something from Netflix you must connect to the Netflix server, and they provide the content. If Netflix goes down, then say bye bye to your Netflix and chill night, well at least the Netflix part. When you download a file with BitTorrent, you connect to many computers that have the file you want. Movies, music, software, and any digital file are just a bunch of binary code and you download a little bit from each computer, and then put it all together in the end. If one computer you are downloading the file from goes down, it's no big deal, usually someone else will have that piece. Of course, anti-piracy organizations hate this, as there is no central body to go after, and hence go after individuals. Let's talk about Bitcoin now. Bitcoin is to currency as BitTorrent is to files. It is a decentralized currency. To illustrate how Bitcoin works let's run through an example. Think of wanting to pay for a Starbucks coffee with your debit card. What essentially you want to do is transfer some amount of money from your bank account into Starbucks's account. You swipe your card, a connection is established to your bank's servers which has a list of everyone's account and how much money they have in that account. This list is called a ledger. The proper amount is deducted from your account, and added to Starbucks's. In other words, the bank's ledger is updated to reflect this transaction. Without the middleman, in this case your bank, the transaction would not take place. Which means, that if the bank server went down, just like our Netflix example, you could not make use of the service. Similarly, if you want to purchase something online, one frequently uses PayPal, a trusted third party. The important part is that you always must connect to a centralized server to either update a ledger, or stream your media in our examples. This implies there is only one point of failure. It also implies that if the bank wanted to it could modify the ledger, or withhold your funds. Further, international bank transfers are very slow, and can be a nightmare. Now let's say Starbucks accepts Bitcoin, and you wanted to use that to purchase your coffee. In other words, you want to transfer an amount of Bitcoin from your Bitcoin account to Starbucks's. There is no Bitcoin server, or Bitcoin phone number to call to aid you in this. What you must do is broadcast a message to the Bitcoin network stating your intentions. Something that looks like this. The network must update the Bitcoin ledger with this transaction now. But, recall there is not just one ledger. The ledger is distributed to many many computers around the world called nodes. The ledger is public domain, anyone can have it. In some amount of time the transaction is confirmed and the ledgers are updated. You get your coffee and are on your merry way. Notice, that if one node is down, it doesn't really matter as there are multiple copies of the ledger. There is no one single point of failure. There is no need to trust any one node. 
you put trust in the network. If one node modifies the ledger, the others will know and deem this ledger invalid. This is the basic idea of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. That is, to take away power from one centralized entity that controls our money and give it to thousands of people. You may be asking yourself, what is stopping someone from using my Bitcoin account, and how exactly does the transaction take place? To answer this, let's make an analogy with a bank account. A bank account is a group of numbers that the bank generates, and associates to you. You can give anyone this number and they can send you money. However, if you wish to send someone money from this account, you must provide either an online password that only you know, or have some identification for the bank teller indicating that you in fact own the account. The point is that anyone can send you money knowing your bank account but would not be able to withdraw from it. The same can be said with Bitcoin. You can create a Bitcoin account, which is called a wallet, or sometimes a public key, and share this with the whole world. The only thing someone can do with it is send you Bitcoin. Of course, since the Bitcoin ledger is public they can also look up your account balance and transaction history. The point here, again, is that they will not be able to withdraw Bitcoin from your account without something called a private key. A private key and public key go hand in hand. In fact, the way Bitcoin works is it creates a private key first and from this makes a public key. Think of this as you creating an online password first, which then your bank uses to generate your bank account number. It uses something called the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. This is quite complicated as it requires modular arithmetic, and exactly how it works is beyond the scope of this video. A concern one may have is that if you have someone's public key, couldn't you just reverse engineer and get the private key? The answer is yes, but extremely difficult. It is so difficult, it is said to be impossible. Why is that? The best analogy can be drawn from prime numbers. Prime numbers are the building blocks of numbers that are not prime. A prime number is something that can only be divided by itself and one, and leaves no remainder. For example, 5 is prime because it can only be divided by 5 and 1. If you divide it by 2, you will get a remainder of 0.5. 10 is not prime because it can be divided by 10, 5, 2, and 1. So note that 10 can be made by multiplying two prime numbers, 5 and 2. This is what is meant by prime numbers being the building blocks of non-prime numbers. Now say I give you the number 987,654,321. And ask for the prime numbers that make it up. This is a very hard problem to figure out. In fact, 987,654,321 is made up by multiplying 3 by 3 by 17 by 17 by 379,721. All these numbers are prime. Now say I give you the prime numbers 5, 7, 13, and 19, and ask for the number these building blocks produce. It is quite easy to grab the calculator and get the answer of 8645. To come back to Bitcoin and draw the analogy, the prime numbers are like the private key that are initially produced, and the number they build is like your public key. The takeaway is that anyone with the private key to an account controls that account. Just like anyone with an email password controls that email. But public keys are only good for receiving, just like an email address. The question is raised now how one proves they are indeed the owners of their account when sending a transaction. As was already stated, a transaction must be broadcast to the Bitcoin network. Obviously, one doesn't want to broadcast their private key, but still must prove they own the account. This is where digital signatures come into play. Say Batman wants to send Robin one Bitcoin for a job well done. Batman will need Robin's Bitcoin public address and the amount he wishes to send. This is then hashed together. Hashing something is a similar concept to the prime numbers example. Hashing takes some input, in this case Robin's Bitcoin address and the amount, and produces some output. The output is usually gibberish to us. The key concept is it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to get back the input from the hashed output. Bitcoin uses something called the SHA-256 algorithm to produce its hashes. Here is the word Batman hashed with this algorithm. 
Again, if I gave you this hash and asked what input gives me this, it is next to impossible to get the word Batman back. So back to the example, Batman hashes together Robin's public address and the amount, and gets the following, which is called a digest. He then takes this digest and adds his private key, and then hashes it again. The final hash is the digital signature. He now broadcasts this to the Bitcoin network. The network will now use a verification algorithm using Batman's public key in the digital signature. Essentially it is another hash that will return the digest. The network also takes the original message and hashes it. If both hashes are the same the transaction is valid. The next concept to talk about is mining. Bitcoin needs to verify transactions, as stated with the Batman example. Verifying these transactions requires computers, computers require power, and power is expensive. There must be some incentive for people to do this verification. The incentive is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is quite valuable right now, so many people want this reward, which in turn is good for the Bitcoin network as one person or group doing all the verifying leads to centralization. Bitcoin wants to distribute this work to many computers around the world, and them to verify at random. The way Bitcoin achieves this is through hashes, which we just discussed, and what can be thought of as blocks. Blocks are nothing more than a group of transactions. So along with Batman's transfer to Robin, let's say Iron Man transferred 20 Bitcoin to Thor, Spider-Man transferred 2 Bitcoin to Doctor Strange, and so on. The transactions are quickly confirmed to be valid individually, or they would get rejected from the block, and then are hashed together along with a guess called a nonce. Hashing this all together produces the gibberish we have previously seen. Every nonce produces widely different results. For example, the word Batman hashed together with the nonce 1 produces this output. Now changing the nonce to 2 produces this output. This is the beauty of the hash. If one thing is changed in the input, no matter how small, the output is very different. The goal is to guess the nonce that produces a hash with a set number of zeros at the beginning of it. For example, the word Batman along with the nonce 4, which remember is just a guess, produces this hash. The more zeros one needs the more difficult it is to solve the hash. Finding the nonce that produces two zeros at the beginning of the hash is still quite quick through trial and error, but already getting more difficult. The answer being 251. But you can imagine if the Bitcoin network requires finding the nonce where the hash has 50 leading zeros, or more. Remember there is no way to go from the hash to the input, so computers cycle through nonces at random trying to find the magical hash. This is what is called mining. Obviously, miners want to guess these nonces very quickly and rely on specialty hardware such as graphics cards and ASIC miners to do this. The one detail we need to add in is that the block that is getting confirmed also relies on data from the previous block's confirmation hash so that the previous block's hash, along with the transaction data of the current block, and nonce are all hashed to find that block's hash. A chain of blocks all reliant on each other is formed. If one tries to change data in a previous block, the subsequent hashes would be invalid, thus discarding that change. This forms the blockchain. Bitcoin's average time to confirm a block is set to 10 minutes and the difficulty is automatically adjusted every two weeks to make sure this is occurring. Difficulty being the number of leading zeros in the confirmation hash. So, if in a two week time frame it took on average 15 minutes to confirm blocks, the network will automatically decrease the number of leading zeros required in the confirmation hash. The problem is, if one wants to use Bitcoin at the grocery store they must wait on average 10 minutes for a confirmation. Most vendors allow what are called zero confirm transactions to get around this, but this can be dangerous. Network speed is one thing that is affecting Bitcoin negatively. Another thing is flexibility. A blockchain can be used to validate and keep a public record of more than just transactions. Enter the world of Ethereum and smart contracts. Ethereum is like Bitcoin as it can be used for transactions. However, it differs as it offers a programmable language that can be executed on the blockchain. For example, say Batman wants to now send 10 Ether, which is the currency of Ethereum, to Robin if the weather in New York is sunny. Using Ethereum's blockchain this is possible. 
Another example is a smart contract for Uber. Imagine taking a trip from point A to point B that is run on a smart contract. The smart contract could take funds from your account and transfer them to the drivers when you reach the destination. This would negate the middleman and Uber being in control of the flow of funds. Ethereum also allows for the creation of tokens. These are essentially a subcurrency in the Ethereum ecosystem. One can imagine these tokens as a local currency specific to a store, for example, think of Canadian Tire Money, or Walmart Dollars. There are of course hundreds of cryptocurrencies and thousands of tokens running on different blockchains. The space is quite lucrative currently, and while lots promise to deliver, blockchain technology is quite new. Transaction time, and transaction volume, in other words, scalability, are major concerns. However, that being said, blockchain technology is not going anywhere anytime soon and is arguably the next big technological advancement. Thank you kindly for watching this episode. I hope you got a little scientized. See what I did there? I name dropped what my channel is called. Boom, so clever. Anyway, if you enjoyed this content please consider doing all that stuff every other video asks you to do. Are you picking up what I am laying down? Of course you are. Okay, have a good one.